Hello everyone. This is Muhammad Imran. You're learning linguistics and literature with Imran. In this lecture, we will learn what is a word and why do languages have morphology. We will also discuss and learn rules formation for lexeme. So let's discuss our today's lecture and discuss in detail what is a word and why do languages have morphology and what are the rules for a lexeme formation. So what is a word? Consider the sort of question you might ask when playing Scrabble. Is Ali a word or when you encounter an unfamiliar word is bounce back ability a word? What you are asking when you answer a question like these is really the question, right? Is X, Y, Z a real word? Our first impulse in answering those questions is to run for our favorite dictionary. If it is a real word, it ought to be in the dictionary. So when such kind of words or we encounter such kind of word like bones, backability, or we encounter such kind of word as alley, right? Or we encounter such kind of word like X, Z, Y. So we go to our favorite dictionary and search there. If these words exist there, then we call them words. And if they don't, we say there is no such word like alley or bounce back ability, right? So we look at in dictionary. What is a word? But think about this answer for just a bit and you'll begin to wonder if it makes sense who determine what goes in the dictionary, right? So that is lexiographer. So these are the people that determine whether such words should go to dictionary or not in the first place. What if dictionaries differ in whether they list a particular word? What if some words exist in one dictionary and some words exist in another dictionary? For example, the official Scrabble Players Dictionary lists alley but not bounce back ability. So in one dictionary, can you find this word, right, alley? But in the same dictionary, you cannot find this word bounce back ability. So the Oxford English Dictionary online doesn't list alley, but it does list bounce back ability. So which one is right? Then you will think which dictionary is right, okay? Oxford English Dictionary online edition or the one that you official scrabble players dictionary. Which one is right one? Further, what about words like caught potato or fresh more that don't occur in any published dictionary yet but can be encountered in media? So on media, we can hear the word like caught potato or fresh more but such words do not exist in any dictionary. So the farmer, according to word spy, this is a website, means a baby who spends too much time watching television. But still, Rake, this word does not exist in dictionary, right? Which one we're talking about? We're talking about corn potato, right? So American might use the term cried potato instead of caught potato, but still on media. And the later is a second year high school student in the US. We're talking about freshmore. The word caught potato dum, which I just made up. So this is a new word, caught potato dum, right? Even this word does not exist on media, okay? So which I just made up. Once you know what a caught potato is, you have no trouble understanding my new words. If it consists of morphemes, has a meaning and can stand alone, doesn't it qualify as a word according to a definition even if it does not appear in any dictionary? So what all these questions suggest is that we have a mental lexicon, a sort of internalized dictionary that consists of an enormous number of words that we can produce or at least understand when we hear them. But we also have a set of word formation rules which allow us to create new words and understand new words 
when we encounter them. So on the one hand, we have mental lexicon, right? So there is internalized dictionary in our mind, right? And we use, and there is a, like, it contains an enormous number of words. And on the other hand, we have word formation rules. And according to those rules, uh, we can create new words and understand new words when we encounter them, right? So already words are there sometimes and we add just morphine and we create new words and we understand them also. So here is a question. Why do languages have morphology? One reason for having morphology is to form new lexemes from old ones. So we have old lexemes and we create or we form new lexemes. For example, we have an old lexeme that is the verb play and when we add er it becomes player or we have old lexeme that is teach and when we add er it becomes teacher or we have an old lexeme that is happy and when we add ness it becomes happiness so this is one reason that we create new lexeme from old one that's why languages have morphologies right we will refer to this as lexeme formation for example from teach teacher from play player from help helper right so this is called lexeme formation so many languages use the term word formation so word formation and lexeme formation are same some of the languages will use lexeme formation while other will use word formation rule so in this specific senses but this usage can be confusing as all of the morphology is sometimes referred to uh, uh, in a large sense as word formation, right? So sometimes all morphology is referred to word formation. That's why it's better to use lexeme formation here. Lexeme formation can do one of the three things. It can change the part of speech. So that is the first thing. It can change the part of speech. For example, uh, we say that teach is a verb and teacher is a noun so that is the change of parts of speech or we say that pure is an adjective and purify is a verb similarly happy is an adjective and happiness is a noun so or category of a word for example turning verbs into noun as i told you they teach is a verb and teacher is a noun right or adjective like for example we say love is a verb and lovable is adjective so that is turning verbs into adjective sometimes we turn verbs into nouns or sometimes into adjective i'll provide you some more example on next slide here we have some more examples of category changing lexeme formation so verbs turn into noun and verbs turn into adjective and nouns turn into adjective. So amuse is a verb and it is turned into noun, amusement. Similarly, impress is a verb and it is turned into adjective, impressive. And monster is a noun and it is turned into adjective and that is monstrous, right? So amuse, amusement, impress, impressive, monster, monstrous, right? So that is what that is a category changing lexeme formation. So the categories change. Here it is a verb and here it is a noun. Here it is a verb and here it is adjective. Here it is a noun and here it is an adjective. Rules for lexeme formation. Some rules of lexeme formation do not change category like from verb into noun. Uh, this does not happen. But they do add substantial new meaning. For example, meaning changing lexeme formation. Here we have that is happy. So happy is adjective. And when we add un, so it becomes unhappy. So happy is also adjective and unhappy is also adjective. So here we do not see that any 
uh, category change. So the category or part of speech, they are not changing, right? So if they are not changing, then what happened? There's only substantial new meaning because happy is a positive adjective and unhappy is a negative. So substantial meanings are added. Similarly, that here we have place where noun lives orphan or an orphanage. So orphan is also a noun and orphanage is also a noun, right? So only substantial meanings are given, right? So here you can see noun into noun, place where uh, noun lives. So one is orphan and orphanage is a place where orphan they live. Right? So, category is not changed. And verbs into verb, right? For example, repeat action, wash and rewash. So, that is a rep repetition of something. And again, category is not changed here. Verb into verb, wash and rewash. Some more rules of lexeme formation. And some rules of lexeme formation both change category and add substantial new meaning. So there are some lexeme formations where both, right? So there is also the changing of category as well as substantial new meanings are given. For example, both category and meaning changing lexeme formation. Here we have example like we have a word that is wash and here we have another word that is washable. So wash is a verb. And washable is adjective, right? So here category also change, right? Because wash is a verb and washable is adjective. And substantial meanings are also attached that is able to be with, right? Nouns turns into verbs. Remove noun from. For example, here we have laus and that is Delouse. So that is the act of removing something. On this slide, we will discuss why do we have rules of lexeme formation. Imagine that it would be like to have to invent a wholly new word to express every single new concept, right? So if we did not have like lexeme formation rules, so for every idea, we would need to create new word, right? So it is the same mentioned here, that wholly a new word to express every single new concept. So for every single new concept, we would be required uh, to invent a new word. For example, if you wanted to talk about the process or result of amusing someone, you couldn't use amusement if you did not have like lexeme formation rule. So then you would need to invent a new word, but would have to have a term like zoj instead. Instead of amusement, perhaps you would have a word that will be zoj. And if you wanted to talk about the process or result of uh, resenting someone, right? So you couldn't use resentment, but would have would have to have something like, uh, for example, plates instead and so on. So for every new concept, you would need to create new word if we did not have lexeme formation rule. And then uh, suppose now you have a total uh, like a, a mental lexicon. Suppose you have uh, 5 million then you would need it to have 10 million or 15 million or 20 million or we would have a very, very uh, big dictionaries. It would have a lot of words, right? As you can see, rules of lexeme formation allow for a measure of economy in our mental lexicon. We can recycle parts as it were to come up with new words. We just add sometimes prefix and sometimes suffix and we create new words. So this is okay 
lexeme formation rule. We have old lexeme and we form new lexeme just by adding sometimes prefix and sometimes suffix. Sometimes we have substantial meaning and sometimes we change the category of a lexeme. So very uh, like essential, right? It's very important to have like lexeme formation rules and very important to have morphology in a language. It is probable, safe to say that all languages have some way of forming new lexeme, although as you will see, uh, as in this book, progresses, that those on this slide, we will discuss word forms. On the other hand, we sometimes use morphology even when we don't need new lexeme. For example, we saw that each lexeme can have a number of word forms. The lexeme walk has forms like walk, walks and walked and walking. That can be used in different grammatical contexts, right? So it means that sometimes we don't need new lexeme, but still, right, each lexeme can have a number of word form, right? So walk is uh, like the basic or core meaning is given by the word walk. And then we have like the present form of walk. We have uh, with the third person walks and we have past form of walked and we have present participle form of walking. That can be used in different grammatical contexts. For example, walk is used in present tense with plural subject and walks is used with singular subject and walked is used in past tense and walking is used as a present participle form of verb. When we change the form of word so that it fits in a particular grammatical context. So we are concerned with that linguistic, uh, with what linguistic call inflection. So these are now inflection, right? Walks, so adding S with walk is inflection form of walk. And adding ED, that is also inflection. And adding ING is also inflection. So inflection word formation is word formation that express grammatical distinction like number singular versus plural. So inflectional word formation is a word formation that expresses grammatical distinction like number, singular versus plural, tense, present versus past, person, first, second or third person, and case, subject, object, possessive, among other. So these are the different functions of inflectional word formation, right? For example, we have a word that is singular, book, and when we add S, so that is inflectional morpheme. So it makes plural of a word, like books, or we have a word chair, and when we add S, that is inflectional morpheme, and it makes plural chairs. Similarly, tense, present versus past, we have a verb, suppose that is work, I work hard, and I worked hard, and uh, I have worked hard. So you can see here that present versus past. And also person, first, second, and third person. With first person, we don't add inflectional morphine, right? Like if I say, I teach, and he teaches, or she teaches. And with second person, and third person. With third person, we add inflectional morphine, S, or ES. She teaches, or I teach, and you teach. And case, subject, object, and possessive case also inflectional word formation is there, among other. It does not result in the creation of new lexemes. So inflectional word formation does not help to create new words, but they are helpful to make a word from singular to plural, from present to past, and tense, and first person, second, and third person, but merely changes the grammatical form of lexeme to fit into different grammatical contexts. So what is the role? The role of the, of the inflectional word formation is to change the grammatical form of lexeme to fit into different grammatical contexts. So what is different grammatical context? Singular, plural, present, past, first person, second or third person. Interestingly, languages have widely different amount of inflection. English has relatively little inflection. So English language has little inflection, while other languages have more. 
we create different form of nouns according to number like wombat and wombats. We mark the possessive form of a noun with s or uh, apostrophe s or uh, s apostrophe. The wombat's eyes. We have different form of verbs for present and past and for, and for present and past participle. Sing, sang, singing, sung. And we use uh, a suffix as to mark the third person singular of a verb. She sings. So that is like English uh, inflectional morpheme or English inflection. Okay, that we have possessive form. Oh, so we, we begin from here. We have plural form, wombat and wombats. We have possessive form that is with apostrophe S or S apostrophe, the wombat's eyes. And we have present and past, right? Like sing, sang, singing, sung. And we also use suffix S to mark third person singular of a verb like she sings. So this is okay, the role of inflectional morpheme uh, that we use. But inflectional morpheme, they do not change category, but only substantial meaning. And these substantial meanings are in the form of making plural, in the form of making a tense like from present to past, or possessive form, right? Or sometimes uh, also with third person like she sings and he sings. So this is the last slide of today's lecture. But some languages have much less inflection than English does. So even there are languages where we have little number of inflection than English has. Because English has itself little number of inflection. So for example, Mandarin Chinese, for example, has almost none, right? So this is a language which is spoken in China and it has no inflection. Rather than marking plural by suffixes as English does or by prefixes as the Bantu language Swahili does, Chinese does not mark plural or past tenses with morphology at all. So they have new words or different words. So this is not to say that a speaker of Mandarin cannot express whether it is one jarab or two jarab or many jarab that are under discussion or whether the sighting was yesterday or today. It simply means that to do so, a speaker of Mandarin must use a separate word like one, two or many or a separate word for past to make the distinction. So they will say, for example, one jarab or two jarab or ten jarab right and we say giraffe and giraffes right or uh, for example uh, we say that play and plate and playing so they will use a different and separate separate entity for past and past uh, present participle right so it means that if you don't have uh, like inflection morpheme so you will create and you will have new word then for that concept so thank you so much. It was all about what is a word and why uh, do we have morphology in languages. And we discuss in detail lexeme formation rules. Please don't forget to subscribe and like the channel and please provide your valuable comments. Thank you so much.